I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's uh, meeting. My name's Sophie Singh. I'm with the Refugee Action Committee and I'll be chairing the meeting tonight. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet tonight and pay my respects to elders, both past and present. This meeting is being held by the Refugee Action Committee here in Canberra and we're going to be looking at the recently enacted Border Force Act and what that means for asylum seekers and refugees detained in Australian run immigration detention centres and what it means for people who work with uh, um, uh, refugees and asylum seekers in those centres. This meeting is part of an ongoing campaign that's happening across Australia to raise awareness of how people seeking asylum in Australia are being treated and by treated re-damaged emotionally, physically traumatised under, under Australia's asylum seeker and refugee policy regime. The punitive policies of deterrence being prosecuted by the Australian Government and supported by the Labor Party are inflicting significant and in some cases irreversible harm on vulnerable people. People who have committed no crime, people who are guilty of no offence. Throughout the various iterations of asylum seeker and refugee policy in Australia, it's been no accident that the immigration detention centres have been located in remote, inaccessible locations. Access to the people incarcerated in those centres has been deliberately made very difficult. Difficult for journalists, for lawyers and for medical professionals. And restricting access to these people serves a number of purposes. It further ena enables the government to dehumanise refugees and asylum seekers, to make them the other, to make them different from us. It hides their stories and it obscures the terrible treatment and conditions that people face in Australian-run immigration detention centres. Almost every day now we are hearing more of the horrors that people are facing in Nauru and Manus Island. The Border Force Act is just the last in a string of measures to enable this treatment the government would like to continue with impunity, without checks and without transparency, and to silence those who continue to speak out against the human rights violations that are happening to people in those centres. We in the Refugee Action Committee passionately advocate for a different approach. There is a better alternative, an alternative approach that treats vulnerable people with dignity, an approach that upholds human rights an approach that reflects the dignity and humanity of the Australian society and not the abasement that we currently have. And we are urging you all to be part of the campaign to bring about fundamental change in how Australia treats refugees and asylum seekers to support an alternative, positive approach. We've got two great speakers tonight. Jack Waterford, former Canberra Times editor, and Matthew Zagor, Associate Professor in Law at ANU. After uh, Matthew and Jack have spoken, there will be opportunities for questions uh, and I would expect that the meeting, um, uh, uh, just to let you know, uh, will wrap, we'll wrap up about 8pm. I'd like to introduce Matthew Zagel. Uh, Matthew's worked at the International Secret Secretariat of Amnesty International as a refugee coordinator at their Australian section and in the Migration Review Tribunal. As a solicitor, he has worked primarily with migrants and asylum seekers. Most recently, his research has been on political and legal responses to irregular migration. Please welcome Matthew Zagel. Thanks, Sophie. Um, and thanks for the invitation to speak to you and to, to John. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people on whose land we're meeting this evening and to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I also want to acknowledge the bravery of those medical workers who have said that they will defy the Border Force Act, they will follow their conscience, that they will be true to their vocation, refuse to be co-opted and silenced by an unconscionable policy. A policy... policy which is designed ultimately to shield the Australian public from seeing the extent to which our government is derelict in its basic duty to treat refugees with respect and to recognise their humanity. Now, my job this evening, apart from being the warm-up act for Jack, the main attraction, 
is to take you through the legislation itself. It's an unenviable task. The legislation's lengthy, it's convoluted, and for someone who's worked in the area of refugee law for the past 25 years, it's unhealthily depressing. It comes, moreover, at the head of a veritable avalanche of rights-infringing statutes. Whenever we think we've reached a new nadir, the government surprises us with more. That in itself is revealing. It seems that when it comes to something such as marginalising, silencing and denigrating boat arrivals, more can always be done. It's as if we need to keep convincing ourselves that the threat is real. Yet the thing about addressing an irrational fear, and this is an irrational fear, is that whatever you do will never be enough. And this is what makes this legislation and its companion act so very frightening. I keep wondering how much further can they go? So let's start by putting the new legislation in its context in order to understand why it was introduced beyond the impenetrable and misleading managerial and security speak that's found in the official documents. It was drafted in the wake of a raft of legislative changes which have made it more difficult for refugees to present their cases and to be heard before our tribunals. That treats their stories as inherently problematic that actually requires decision makers to ignore certain evidence and to reach negative conclusions about an asylum seeker's credibility. In other words, legislation that treats refugees as somehow up to no good. Queue jumpers attempting to take advantage of our credulity. The common thread here is how the government treats and manages information how they need to control the story that we hear from the refugee and about the refugee. It was also tabled following several incidents in detention centres, which we only know about because employees and contractors working in Nauru and Manus Island were brave enough to speak out. This was information the government had no control over that threatened its dominant narrative. Its response was to condemn the condemners. It's a classic technique of denial whenever human rights violations occur anywhere around the globe. So the employees of Save the Children were treated as politically motivated, as coaching children to self-harm and to lie about sexual abuse. Allegations we now know not to be true. The legislation was also tabled in the shadow of a political storm about a report handed down by an internationally respected jurist working for an independent statutory authority who had found that children's rights in detention had been and were being breached by successive governments, Labour and Coalition. Once again, the government's response was to shoot the messenger, to treat the author, Professor Gillian Triggs, as politically motivated, to attack her in the media and in Parliament, and importantly, to ignore both the content and recommendations of the report. Finally, let's not forget that it was tabled by a government which did three things immediately upon coming into power. It changed the language that we use to describe boat arrivals by requiring all government departments from here on to describe them as illegal. It threw a cloak of secrecy over their treatment in the name of national security, using the buzz term operational matters, and it had Parliament give them unprecedented powers to deal with what they described as a crisis on our seas. It even changed the name of the department to reflect the new securitised reality of migration. Multiculturalism was gone from the title to be replaced with a more serious and fear-inducing border protection. In other words, Australian governments have repeatedly shown that they are desperate to control both the narrative and the language of public discourse. This is because words matter. The words we choose to use in our lives frame how we and others perceive and interpret the world around us. They carry with them the values and judgments, the connotations and implications that society ascribes them. The government knows this. Why else would they ban freedom muesli bars from detention centres? <laughs> Because as Transfield officers said, this is a quote, the word freedom is very sensitive to transferees. You don't think. <laughs> the answer to this, of course, seems to be that you have to remove the word from the lexicon, from the line of vision of the refugees. And the Australian public is being handled no differently. 
if you spend two years insisting that our borders are under threat, use the military term operational to describe every incident on the seas, use the military itself to intercept the vessels packed with so-called illegal arrivals, and insist that to talk about such things publicly would undermine our efforts to tackle international crime, people will eventually accept not just its truth, but legislation that acts on such truths. We will accept giving the Department of Immigration such powers which would ordinarily be unthinkable in the hands of a civilian authority during peacetime. And we will be little troubled when secrecy is entrenched and transparency abrogated. Which is where the Border Force Act comes in. And there were, in fact, two pieces of legislation which came into effect on the 1st of July. It's almost 300 pages of new provisions inserted into dozens of acts, creating the new Leviathan-like Department of Immigration and Border Protection with its new operational enforcement arm, the Australian Border Force, with its spiffy new uniforms. There was also a third piece of legislation introduced at the same time, which has yet to be passed by both houses. It's the almost humorously misnamed Maintaining the Good Order of Immigration Detention Facilities Bill 2015. <laughs> This is a bill which even the supine opposition has found it difficult to support. Should it pass, it will provide powers and immunities to staff working in detention centres, that includes private contractors and subcontractors, to use force where they subjectively believe it's necessary to keep order. Compare this to a prison, where a prison guard can only use force as a last resort and where it's objectively reasonable. Absent amendment, no such limits will be imposed on those guarding immigration detainees, including refugees. What does it mean? It means CERCO officers will have an almost unfettered power to use force to put down legitimate instances of dissent and protest in the detention centres. They will also be relatively free from reporting requirements and potential lawsuits. For those of us concerned about silencing the voice of refugees, and that ultimately is why I believe we're probably here this evening, and it's a great turnout tonight, by the way, we must equally be vigilant and vocal in opposing this upcoming legislation. So what does the Border Force Act itself do? It creates the position of the Border Force Commissioner. It merges customs and immigration. And those parts of the department that currently deal with compliance, enforcement and detention will now fall under the Australian Border Force and the authority of the Commissioner, whose status is now the same as the head of the AFP and the ADF. Now, at one level, this isn't particularly worrisome. Border protection is a national security issue, after all. Surely the agency that deals with it should have appropriate powers. The problem, however, lies in what is essentially a form of security creep and the ways in which our migration and humanitarian program has become seamlessly folded into and effectively absorbed by a security risk paradigm. So, for instance, there are the expanded surveillance powers that authorise the use of false identities to gather information. And there's the labelling of the whole department as a criminal law enforcement agency so that it can be granted telecommunication interception warrants which provide access to a person's stored communications. Such powers are commonly used by the police, but by staff members with no experience or training in this area, it becomes rather concerning. It also seems likely that such warrants will be used to access communications of departmental officials themselves suspected of misconduct. In fact, there's a rather unsettling 1970s East Germany feel about much of this, with everyone watching everyone else, a panopticon of paranoia held together by a surveillance machinery that's directed as much internally as externally, a microcosm of the surveillance state existing in this dystopian universe of our migration program. The pointy end of the internal surveillance machinery is found in the alcohol and integrity testing provisions. Integrity testing. This allows the surveillance of staff 
and the collecting, using, storing and sharing of personal data. And it may include, by the way, the use of optical, listening, data and tracking devices for the purpose of monitoring an officer of the department. Now, all this is designed to prevent corruption and misconduct, and that's surely a good thing. But let's not forget, this is still primarily a civilian agency. It's one of the perverse results of the securitization and militarization of migration that the civilian agency that regulates it is now to be subjected to such intrusive measures. Moreover, one's left with a strong impression that much of the legislation targeted at the department is designed, at least in part, to prevent the leaking of information about what's going on in our camps of shame here and overseas. Unfortunately, it's far from the end of the story when it comes to the department. There's the stripping of protections against unfair dismissal. There are dob-in mechanisms which would require employees to report on the conduct of their colleagues. And there's a definition of serious misconduct that's so broad and vague that it would leave any worker paranoid that their day-to-day -day activities were under threat. Now, we all know the department has had its bad days. The problem of low morale and a siege mentality were identified in the Palmer and Comrie inquiries. And as anyone who has friends or family in the department knows, addressing its organisational culture has been a, a constant and ongoing challenge. This legislation doesn't help. It treats department employees, including those outside the front line of the ABF itself, with an unprecedented degree of suspicion and distrust. Which brings me at last to the whistleblower provisions themselves. In brief, this is what Parliament has done, and remember this was supported by the Labour Party. It introduced a new provision which makes it an offence for an entrusted person to disclose what's called protected information. An entrusted person is defined to include pretty much anyone working in any capacity with the Department of Immigration and Border Protection. The government's told us the secrecy provision is in line with partner and like agencies such as the AFP and ADF. Now, putting aside whether the department is or should be treated in the same way as the police and the military, the implication that this is okay because it's already in the law is at best a partial truth. The Crimes Act does indeed contain an almost identical provision. It's been there since 1914. And every inquiry, bar none, for the past 30 years that's considered its place in a modern, accountable, transparent, liberal, democratic system has called for it to be repealed. Yet instead of its repeal, what we have here is its extension. Why? How is that justified in the participatory democracy? Historically, such provisions enjoy particular popularity in times of real and imagined crises, the First World War, the communist scare of the 1950s. I can only surmise that the threat posed by refugees crossing our borders is being seen in a similar light. Now, the government's told us that individuals will not be gagged on matters of public interest. The newly installed and Bizarrely, prime ministerially blessed ADF commissioner, I don't know if you saw the blessing ceremony, um, has assured us that they have no intention of prosecuting those who disclose things. And the Labour opposition has pointed out that whistleblower laws still apply. So why are we not reassured? For three reasons. First, because the government has form. When Save the Children whistleblowers reported there was child sexual abuse, violence and self-harm in Nauru, the department contacted the AFP to investigate the employees, not the alleged allegations, the violations. When detention centre workers leaked documents to the ABC indicating that Hamad Kahazi's death was probably preventable had their calls for medical assistance been heeded, the AFP called in Dr Peter Young and told him that they'd been monitoring his metadata and who he'd been communicating with, something we now know the department has increased powers to do under the Act. His staff were also warned not to speak to the Triggs inquiry for fear of retribution. The government, as I said, has form, and remember, it needs to control the narrative. The second reason why we're not reassured is because, as I 
hope I've demonstrated, the legislation itself seems deliberately designed to detect and punish those who release information about operational matters. As a result, even if you don't fall foul of the secrecy provisions, you may still face dismissal as a result of the new powers given to the Commissioner to control employees' conduct. And I haven't even had a chance to go into all the minutiae of that. This leads to my third and final reason why we're not reassured. It's because the legislation is now so convoluted and so ambiguous that it would take a legal mind greater than mine to work out in what circumstances an individual might feel on safe ground blowing the whistle on human rights violations. And that, I suspect, is exactly how the government likes it. Now, in black letter terms, there are still whistleblower protections available, both within the legislation itself and the Public Interest Disclosure Act. And there are protections against reprisals. The problem, however, is that this legislation sets such a high legalistic and complicated test for working out if it will protect you. It involves a balancing act to ensure that disclosure is in the so-called public interest, but it doesn't tell us what that means or how to engage in that balancing act itself. And it's worth remembering that both Labour and coalition governments have a history of abusing the public interest clauses in legislation. A government's idea of the public interest in such circumstances is likely to be different from that of a medical worker who's taken an oath to do no harm. It's no wonder that they are feeling the chilling effects of the new laws already. So let me finish up. Polls indicate that negative attitudes towards boat arrivals is frequently a response to the sense that they represent some sort of abstract threat. This legislation caters to those fears. It stokes the flames of Australia's long-standing moral panic about our borders and attempts to co-opt monitor and silence those agencies and professionals whose jobs should be informed by the values of humanity rather than a fortress mentality. It's an act steeped in the negative symbolism of borders and tainted by our collective anxieties. It's an act that grants unprecedented police powers to a civilian department, including private contractors who oversee a particularly vulnerable community of refugees. And most significantly for me as a refugee lawyer, it's an act that attempts to control what we see and hear and witness about the camp set up and overseen by our government both here and overseas. What it reveals to me is a government of fear rather than of hope, one concerned more with blame than truth, blinded by conspiracy theories about those who critique it, even when they do so under the law. It's legislation that takes away rights while asking us to trust those it provides with unprecedented and largely unaccountable power. I, for one, am unwilling, unwilling to do so and will continue to oppose the Act and call for its repeal. Thank you.